It's hard to find the words to describe most of New Zealand. The colors, the vistas have to be seen, have to be experienced. It's a land where nature has had the upper hand, and man is a relative newcomer. Where ancient forces are still at work, and the cook, so to speak, is still in the kitchen. Our touchdown point in New Zealand was Auckland, about a 15-hour flight from California and one of the gateway cities for Air New Zealand, the airline that provided our transportation. Not only busy as a gateway for air and sea traffic, Auckland is home to 800,000 of the nation's 3 million people. It's a modern city with glistening high-rise buildings, the bustling business districts, the downtown, the upscale shopping areas, with the upscale sights and sounds, as well as the unusual market areas for the tourist or for the curio shopper. And the people who live here in Auckland love their city and what it has to offer. It's a beautiful city. Uh, we've got seven beautiful hills that are parks. We've got endless beautiful beaches. And then we have the advantages of a city. And, um, and of course the people, warm and friendly, and um, as I say, the harbour is not to be missed. Um, I think that's the big thing that Auckland's got going for it, is a, is a tremendous harbour. Over the years, the city of Auckland's acquired a nickname. They call it the City of Sails, because just about everybody and their next door neighbour owns a sailboat here, and there's never a shortage of time when you can use it, because the wind blows all the time. The wind is a sailor's wish come true, blowing out of the west, blowing steady, and even in the winter, not blowing too cool. But for us, it was the view that made our charter worth the effort. The seascapes of Auckland are spectacular, the product of ancient volcanoes that forged the area. It's no wonder Aucklanders have an affinity for the water. They're surrounded by it, surrounded by natural beauty. For those people who like the idea of being literally surrounded by water, Auckland has the only aquarium in the world that puts people on the inside and the fish on the outside. You might say it's a rather unique idea the New Zealanders have come up with for bringing people face to face with nature. Then maybe you haven't seen some of the golf courses in New Zealand, nature's own gallery. Now the consolation is these spectators cut the grass, they fertilize the fairways, and then give everything they have to cover the green fees. The only thing you have to remember is step carefully over the electric fences surrounding each of the greens. Oh, uh, one note of caution. You have to step high to get over some fences in New Zealand. Not all of them are designed to keep back sheep and cattle. Come on, girls. Come on, girlings. That's right, deer rancher. A little ironic for New Zealand, because not too long ago, deer were considered the scourge of the nation's valuable grazing land. Now they're becoming big business. Yeah, well, we started deer farming in 1980 and just bought a few hinds, and we've bred up a herd of about 300 hinds and supporting young stock in that time. And not only is the and business the growing for New Zealand deer farmers, the demand for venison that began in Europe is now spreading to yuppie USA, where slim is in. It's low in cholesterol and extremely low in fat. And uh, for that reason, it's a, it's a very good meat to choose when you're having dinner out. So while Bruce is telling me about what yuppies are eating at home, I'm noticing that he lives on top of the world. And those hills over there are where we're headed next. More of the same ahead? Not by a long shot. We're now about as close to hell, or at least how I imagine hell to be, as I ever hope to get. This is the Waimungu Thermal Valley, a land of steaming craters, and home to one of the largest boiling lakes in the world. Water temperatures of 140 degrees and up are just a hint of what's happening underground. Ooh, that's hot. You know, this valley's a good example that Nature gives us hints of what might be going on beneath ground now and then, and they might be hints that we should pay attention to. Up until 1904, there was a geyser that shot off in this valley. It went 1,500 feet into the air. Then that year, it stopped. No one could figure out exactly why, but 13 years later, they found out what was happening with all that pressure. The valley blew up, sent steam and rock flying over the edge, and killed a woman and her child. When a man ran to town to tell everyone about it, they didn't believe him. 
It was April Fool's Day. But today, the land is tranquil. And a few hundred yards away, you can cruise peacefully on the Steel Blue Lake, a lake that didn't exist 101 years ago. June 10th, 1886, what used to be here shot into the sky. Now, it's estimated it blew out of this area, which we're now sailing in, which was one complete valley. If you look out on the right as we go further out, you'll see the sheer cliffs. It's estimated it blew out of here 2,000 million cubic meters of earth. It blew it straight up into the air and deposited all around where the eye can see. It completely devastated this area, covered the whole area with mud, lava, and clay. And once again, the land is tranquil. The steaming lakeshore, a reminder that the cook is indeed still in the kitchen. New Zealand is not only beautiful, it's full of surprises. They are uniquely New Zealand. They are the Maori, New Zealand's indigenous people struggling to maintain their cultural identity in what's become a country of European majority. The Maori are Polynesian. Their rural lifestyle has changed over the years. Young people have left the villages and moved to the cities, forgotten their language, lost their culture. Now, in 1987, all across the country, the old is new again. There is a renaissance in native art. Young people, like Kemera Wilson, are relearning the carving of their grandparents' generation, and in doing so, learning their great-grandparents' legends. The whole thing is called a popo, um, and it represents a legend. And it's um, about a guy called Tinido riding his whale, which is up, up there. And this uh, mermaid, mermaid uh, figure here is uh, his lover. She changed into a mermaid to get to him. The wood carvings are intricate, the legends complex. And in an art world now hungry for native arts, the demand and price is high. A um, piece about this size would be worth about fifteen to seventeen thousand. I believe a few years back, um, pieces were sold for pennies, um, and you, about ten, come ten years forward, they sell sold for thousands or thousands of dollars. And where's the justice in that? I ask. Young Maori men learn the carving at this technical institute devoted to their people. The young Maori women, likewise, learn what once was an everyday part of their life. In 150 years, I suppose you can say, where it's taken a European 2,000 years to get where they are today, it's taken the Maori 150 years to catch up. And in that space of time, we've left a little bit of our culture behind. And this institute is responsible for making them catch up again. Maori tikis carved from jade were once considered little more than cute native trinkets. Now they're sold in high-priced art galleries to collectors. Some of the highest-priced items come from this studio belonging to Happy Maxwell. He was a truck driver until a few years ago, then he lost both his legs in an accident. His work is famous throughout New Zealand. I've now turned to doing things with my hands, and um, I've looked into this type of work, and uh, I've landed on my feet, if you might say. The center of Maori life and art is Rotorua, about midway down on New Zealand's North Island. It is a thermal area of unbelievable beauty, power, and eeriness. Rotorua is a volcanic opening. A lush green valley runs through town. The valley is spotted with boiling mud cauldrons. The valley is a perfect setting for a Jules Verne novel, an opening to the core of the earth. It looks like a valley that time forgot, and yet, like clockwork, it comes alive with geysers which shower the area with scalding water and create the plumes of steam which nourish the plant life. The Maori have always used geothermally heated water to live, used it for cooking and for cleaning, and in 1987, they find themselves still using it to attract tourists. 300,000 people a year wander through this Maori village and past a Maori problem, burial. Bodies are left in vaults above ground because the temperature is so high below ground. As a people, they've never ever believed in cremation and with the thermal activity here, 
to put the body in the ground, we feel it's as good as cremation. So the vaults are built on top of the ground, the coffins are lowered inside the vault and then they're sealed at the top. This is the solution to another Maori problem, language. Over the years, a need to integrate into a European-dominated society has left most Maori unable to speak their own language. Now they're learning again as children. We teach them young because, I don't know, somehow they teach you to get to a child. When you're older, your mind is set on a certain thing and there's no way anyone's going to bend your will unless you've got a weak willpower. Then they can bend you. But these ones, they're only babies, and it's like picking up a clay, you know, it's still moist and it's still green. You can mould it. We also think that New Zealand is a God-given country to us. We are led here. And it's not likely that any other country aside from New Zealand would speak our language. So we've got to make an attempt to go back in time and say, now, let's get together with this. Without a, a language, a uh, race is lost. From their homelands, their music, their art and culture, the Maori are a rich people who are reawakening to their wealth and in doing so making New Zealand a richer place. One, two, one, two, one.